All right, so hello and welcome back. So we're going to take a look at Napoleon's Great Blunder in Spain, 1808. Lastly, we took a look at uh, Battle of Friesland. It should be up there as a playlist. I suggest you go watch those videos so you catch up on what's going on here. So we will continue the series. Please leave a like, subscribe, and then I have the original link in the description for the video. Please go check it out there and give them the same love you give me. Otherwise, we shall continue to break this down. An Epic History TV History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In the autumn of 1807, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte dominated Europe. He had humbled Austria and Prussia, and sealed an alliance with Russia. Of the major powers, only Britain still defied him, safe from invasion thanks to its powerful navy. Napoleon had ordered all territory controlled by France or its allies to stop trading with Britain, the so-called Continental System, or blockade, designed to wreck Britain's economy and force its government to make peace. But neutral Portugal had continued to trade with its historic ally, Britain. So Napoleon sent an army under General Junot to occupy the country and force it into line. The invasion was supported by France's ally, Spain. Though privately, Napoleon held Spain's rulers in contempt. The Bourbon royal family was decadent and corrupt. The king and crown prince loathed each other. While the country was effectively run by Chief Minister Manuel Godoy, the Queen's lover. Spain. You can see it's a whole bunch of political bullshit. Spain, Napoleon concluded, was backwards, militarily weak and incompetently governed, and he devised a plan to seize control of the country. Spaniards, after long agony your nation was perishing, I have seen your pain and I am bringing you a remedy. Proclaimed by Emperor Napoleon, my remedy is my brother. So. This is one of Napoleon's major mistakes. This and Russia. Both of these didn't have to happen. It's not like Germany where it was going to happen. No, this this, this doesn't have to happen. <laughs> um, and Spain will be a thorn in his side for the rest of his life. Um, until basically until the fall of the empire and then after Waterloo and he's kicked off to Helena and then dies there. Um, this is, this is it. This is a guerrilla war that he will never win. Um, going to be the downfall of like half his fucking army. In the spring of 1808, under the pretext of guarding Spain against the British, French troops took up strategic positions around the country. Do not worry, we are here to protect you. By occupying their cities and strategic important objectives. Do not worry, we are here to protect you from yourselves. Oh, yes, yourself. The Spanish people saw the French military presence as the latest in a long line of humiliations and held Chief Minister Manuel Godoy responsible. There were riots at the palace of Aranjuez. Godoy was nearly lynched. Napoleon invited the Spanish royal family and Godoy to take refuge in the French city of Bayonne and sent Marshal Murat and 50,000 troops to restore order in Madrid. But on the 2nd of May 1808, the people of Madrid rose up against Murat's soldiers. It became known as the Dos de Mayo Uprising, immortalised by the artist Francisco Goya. This scene shows Mamelukes of Napoleon's Imperial Guard attacked by the citizens of Madrid. A hundred soldiers were killed. The French responded ruthlessly, shooting down dozens in the streets and executing more than a hundred by firing squad. This photograph is actually pretty famous. I had to study it for an art class, could you imagine? Um, and break it down. And yeah, it's them basically rep uh, reprising against the, the Spanish. And they will never forget what the French do here. Squad. Meanwhile, in Bayonne, Napoleon forced King Carlos to abdicate and bestowed the title King of Spain on his own brother, Joseph.
Who is the enemy of your happiness? Napoleon, emperor of the French. What is Napoleon's origin? From evil, Spanish pamphlet, catches him. That summer, as Napoleon forced a new modernizing constitution on Spain, and his brother Joseph entered Madrid as its new king, the Spanish reacted with fury. The French weren't just arrogant foreigners trampling on their national honour, they were godless atheists who during the French Revolution had rejected the Pope and Catholic Church. Napoleon, priests warned the peasants, was the very Antichrist himself. This is the very major distinction you have to make. Spain today is very religious. Spain back then was ultra-religious. They were ultra-Catholic. Not just religious, they were ultra-Catholic. France, France was Catholic, relatively still is, um, even today. Uh, but back then it was very religiously Catholic before the revolution. After the revolution, they tried to do this whole worship of a dude. Oh my God, it's, it's ridiculous. Like the sciences of humanity. and the, So they had many cults, uh, worship of scientific crap. And they try to make it like a like an actual religion. I can't remember the name, but it, oversimplified it a video on it. It's fucking amazing. Um, <coughs> needless to say, um, Spain, again, France had recanted on a lot of that, but again, they were still seen as atheists for what they did during the revolution with killing everyone and, you know, the church clerks, the church and the clergy. So Spain rightfully was fearing the same thing would happen. Also, you know, just kicking out the fucking Spanish family that, I don't know, had been ruling the place for a while and had been your allies, also not a very good idea. And then putting your brother on there and this is a fucking cherry on top to be like, aha, I occupy your cities and my French brother will, you know, be your king. And also, I am a empire that, uh, you know, killed a lot of Catholics. So. Revolts erupted across the country. The Spanish army was joined by militias and partisans who attacked French troops and killed collaborators. French soldiers carried out savage reprisals. No mercy was shown. The countless atrocities horrified Francisco Goya and led to his famous Disasters of War series. At first, it seemed the French would easily put down the revolt. Girona, Valencia, and Zaragoza were besieged by French troops, while the Spanish army of Galicia was routed by Marshal Bessier at the Battle of Medina del Rio Seco. But eight days later, as General Dupont and three French divisions withdrew from Cordoba, slowed down by wagons piled high with loot, they were surrounded at Bailen by General Castaño's army of Andalusia and forced to surrender. The Spanish took 18,000 French prisoners, about half of whom later died of starvation. Berlin was a humiliation for France. And the prisoners of war survivability rate back then, when they say half died, that's not out of the ordinary back then. Like, a lot of people died from starvation, sickness. Sickness killed many people. Sickness was the leading cause of death um, in every fucking military campaign up to, and including World War One. World War Two was actually combat deaths related from injuries, but... World War I was still disease. Her first major defeat since Napoleon became emperor. France's enemies across Europe were delighted. Napoleon was incandescent with fury. The situation went from bad to worse. The Portuguese joined the revolt, while fierce Spanish resistance forced the French to abandon the sieges of Valencia, Girona, and Saragossa. Spain's new king, Joseph Bonaparte was even forced to flee the capital. The British assisted the revolt, which the Spanish now called a war of independence, by shipping weapons to Spain using the Royal Navy. On the 1st of August, a small British army commanded by Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Portugal to- And we will continue to hear about Sir Arthur Wellesley. He's not just the commander at Waterloo, he is the one that basically fucking beat every dude in fucking Spain. He's actually a very good commander. Weighed their revolt. On the 17th of August, he beat a small French force at Rolisa. Then four days later, beat Junot's main army at the Battle of Vimero.
but Wellesley's newly arrived superior, Sir Hugh Dalrymple, then agreed to repatriate Junot and his army to France, with all their arms and plunder, using British ships. In Britain, the generous terms were seen as a disgrace and scandal. A subsequent inquiry exonerated Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, but Dalrymple never held command again. It makes sense, he just fucking let like, the whole army just walk away when they were fucked. Everywhere I am absent, they commit nothing but foul follies. The Polish response uh, to the news about them. Now, this is important. This is going to be how Napoleon is defeated. On the field, you basically won't fucking win against him. There are some very specific moments you will, but most of the time you're just fucked. Now, you can beat all of his subordinate commanders. That is possible. And that is what the coalition will do in 1814 for the Battle of France. They won't hit Napoleon. They'll hit everyone besides Napoleon. He can't be everywhere at the fucking same time. And that's how they just basically crush him. Napoleon decided the only way to sort out the situation in Spain was to go there himself. He assembled 130,000 reinforcements, including many of his best troops, and on the 7th of November, led a second invasion of Spain. Most Spanish troops were inexperienced, were often badly equipped and led, and their armies had no coherent strategy. They were no match for the Grande Armée, which burst across the Ebro River and inflicted heavy defeats on the Spanish at Borgos and Tudela. At Tudela, Marshal Land's Third Corps avenged the defeat at Bailin by smashing the army of General Castaños, sending it fleeing in two directions. Napoleon pushed on rapidly. North of Madrid, 8,000 Spanish held the mountain pass at Somosierra. Napoleon, impatient to break through to the capital, ordered forward the Polish Light Horse of the Guard. In an attack of almost suicidal bravery, they charged the Spanish guns head-on and enabled the French to take the pass. Gotta give the fucking Polish cavalry their dues. Poland is... <laughs> Poland's military forces might not be amazingly big, but goddamn, do they have fucking spirit, especially their cavalry, tracing their lineage back to the Winged Hussars. Four days later, after Napoleon threatened to obliterate the city, Madrid opened its gates to his army. Unaware of the disaster engulfing Spanish forces, a 20,000-strong British army, commanded by Sir John Moore, had just arrived in Salamanca, after a 300-mile march from Lisbon. And again, the reason you don't know is, again, everything has to be done by fucking letter, so nobody got a letter to him, he doesn't know. With another smaller force en route from Coruña. The British army was inexperienced, but in contrast to most Spanish forces, it was well-trained, organized, and led. As news reached more of the Spanish collapse, he nevertheless planned to divert French forces by attacking Marshal Soult's isolated Second Corps and threatening Napoleon's communications to Burgos and France. And this all makes sense. You turn his flank, cut him off, and then you get to force him to fight you there. Um, because again, the supply lines, you need to have supply lines, otherwise you're just, especially this period, you're just fucked. At Sagun on the 21st of December, the British 15th Hussars advanced overnight through winter frost and made a dawn attack on a French cavalry brigade, routing it in one great charge. But as more... If you're curious, um, I don't know. These guys are definitely French. They're... Uh, I think they're Dragoons. Um, and these are light Hussars, as I said. Um, I think they're King's German Legion of the British because they were I could be totally wrong. They could be Dutch, too. Uh, but their uniform. Somebody that actually knows the Polyonic uniforms can tell me, but these guys are carabineers, I think. But as Moore prepared a full-scale attack on Soult's corps, he received news that Napoleon was advancing rapidly towards him with his main army from Madrid. I 
and pursuing the English soared to their kidneys. A point. 2nd of January, 1808. While two French corps under Marshal Land began a second bloody siege of Zaragoza, Napoleon saw There's my boy Marshal Land again. a chance to get to grips with the British at last. Intending to trap Moore between his own forces and Soult's second corps, he force-marched his troops over the icy Guadarrama Pass in the midst of a blizzard. Moore, facing odds of more than two to one, immediately ordered a retreat, planning to march 250 miles to the coast, where his army could be evacuated by the Royal Navy. That makes sense. He can't... He realizes he's not going to be able to beat Napoleon there. If he can get to the sea, he's got a fucking chance. For both sides, the race to the sea was an exhausting slog through mountains, mud, and bitter cold. Many fell by the wayside as British discipline collapsed, leading to looting and drunkenness, except among the rear guard which fought several skillful delaying actions and kept the French at bay. I need to think back then, pay was maybe whenever you fucking got it, food, maybe whenever you got it. Being a soldier back then was not a fucking prestigious job, I will put it to you very bluntly. Being an officer, different story. Being a soldier, fuck no. You tried literally everything to not be a soldier. It was a very bad job, it was very bad. You got shit. Soldiers of Britain's elite 95th Rifles were prominent in these skirmishes. This specialised light infantry regiment wore green uniforms for better concealment, and were one of the few units on any side armed with rifles. Unlike the standard smoothbore musket... Yeah, the Baker's Rifle. Uh, you had to watch the Sharp series, it's very comical and, you know, all that shit, but it, it really does show, like looting and fucking uh, ever just the depravities of what the fuck they had to do in the 1800s uh, but rifles are slow they are more accurate but they are slow and you have to clean them and they are a bitch to clean um because remember you can't open the back of these guns it's not possible you have to stick a ramrod down here and clean it out and let me tell you and if you have had a gun before you know this if you pull an ar-15 apart right you can pull the whole fucking barrel out and you can clean both sides and that is very good and very effective way to clean the damn thing right you can't do that with one of these. You just hope you can, you know, clean it out because I mean, you're not going to be able to get any of the shit out of the buck. You're not going to be able to, you know, get a twig pick and pick at the, the, the fine powder there. No, it's just, it's just there. You you can't. I think you might be able to take the barrel out, maybe. Um, but that's like a armory level kind of shit. You're not doing that in the field. Let's put it that way. It, rifles had spiral grooves in the barrel that spun the bullet as it was fired, making them slower to load but much more accurate. Reliable accuracy about 200 yards. It's, it, for a rifle, that's still a really goddamn hard shot to do. Um, even reliable accuracy for Baron Bess at 80 yards is, is pushing it. Uh, max range, 175, you ain't fucking hit. You ain't hitting the broadside of a barn at 175 meters. 120, 175 yards with a Brown Bess, you ain't hitting shit. Uh, you just need to look at videos on YouTube to know that. Um, it is theoretically possible to hit a 400 yard target with a Baker's rifle. If you don't move and you have time and you can set up a shot, I, I get that. Uh, but again, these are just spiraling. Again, the balls, they're still using balls. They're not using conical bolts or anything. So uh, they're just spinning the ball. I mean, it's still a ball <laughs> at the end of the day. In one legendary incident during Moore's retreat at Cacabelos, rifleman Tom Plunkett picked out and shot dead a French general at 400 yards, some say further. Damn lucky shot. Thanks to the skill of the rear guard and the desperate pace of the retreat, the British kept one step ahead of the French. On New Year's Eve, Napoleon received grave news from Paris. Rumors of plots and Austria mobilizing once more for war. The Emperor immediately left for France, taking many of his best troops with him, and entrusted Marshal Soult and Second Corps with finishing off the British. The pursuit continued, but on the 11th of January 1809, 
Moore's ragged army reached Coruña. For Sir John Moore's exhausted army, the Spanish port meant supplies, rest, and the prospect of rescue. But few ships were there to meet them on the 11th. Fortunately, the British had been able to blow up bridges behind them to delay Marshal Soult's advance. And three days later, on the 14th of January, the naval transports arrived, allowing Moore to begin embarking his cavalry and artillery. And the reason you get those out is it's the most fucking expensive things you have in your army. Cavalry, best troops, every period, literally every single period. Even today we call them still cavalry regiments, mechanized guys. Um, maybe not anymore, but back then, top guys went to the cavalry. Cavalry is very expensive. Guns. Guns are very fucking expensive. What is the last thing that's expensive? Infantry. So the infantry are going to get on last. But the very next day, Soult's army appeared on the hills south of Coruña, taking up positions on the heights of Peñasquedo, where he sighted his main battery of cannon. Half of Moore's army deployed in a defensive line two miles south of the city, with two divisions held back to protect his right flank. Both armies were roughly 16,000 strong. The French had four regiments of dragoons, while the British cavalry was already aboard ship. But the and these regiments of dragoons, I'm assuming, are on his left side, basically what you need to think of them as uh, mobile infantry. So they can ride to position, dismount, and then fight as mobile infantry. Broken terrain of walls, hedges, and olive trees made it a battlefield ill-suited to cavalry. Soult's plan was to attack the British right flank and trap Moore's army against the sea. It makes perfect logical sense here. He has cannons. He doesn't. He can... Soult has the advantage here. He can force an engagement whenever, because otherwise he can just pound the ever-living shit out of him. Um, maybe he has the time constraints on getting the rest of the army out, but again, whatever army's here, he has superior firepower. He's going to try and break his right, because his right is weak. And if he can capture these things, uh, these cities out here, he literally can't escape. Uh, these two cavalry up here are basically just, you know, flank watchers. You get to watch the hill. They're doing the job, doing a vital job, which is, you know, protecting your flank, but you know, they're just going to sit there, really. Around 2 p.m., the French artillery opened fire. Then, Mermet's infantry division advanced, supported by La Housse's dragoons on his left. Moore had been unsure if Salt would attack, and had just ordered Paget's division to begin embarkation. Now he hurriedly cancelled that order, ordering Paget instead to bring up his men to reinforce his open flank, and Fraser's division to take up position on the heights of Santa Margarita. The French advance. It's going to be cutting it a bit close because they're already going to be out there. Through hedges and over walls, with heavy firing from skirmishers on both sides. Then the British counterattacked. The 42nd Highlanders and 50th Foot charged into the village of Elvinia and drove the French out. But in confused fighting, they in turn were soon pushed back to their own lines. Sir John Moore was close to the front line, observing developments, urging on officers and men. But as he ordered up the Guards Brigade to reinforce the line, he was hit in the shoulder by a cannonball. He remained conscious, but it was obvious the wound was fatal, and he was carried back to the city. So there you go. Your commander-in-chief is dead. Effectively dead. I mean, he's going to die either way. Um, and now your army's head is just cut off. So communications, the plan, command, everything is thrown into array. Soult sent forward Merle's division to support the attack on Elvinia. Scottish General Sir John Hope had taken over command of the British Army from the dying Moor, and he ordered forward two battalions of infantry to meet the French attack. Paget's division, led by skirmishers of the 95th Rifles, arrived to shore up the British right flank. The terrain was so bad for horses that French dragoons chose to dismount and fight on foot, but were slowly pushed back by the British. Also, uh, it depends on being, uh, depends between carapaneers and dragoons. 
you can technically fire both of their rifles on horseback, which is sometimes what they did. Sometimes they fought as dismounted infantry. Um, usually dragoons, if I remember correctly, they fought dismounted a lot. Carabineers usually fired mounted. Um, and that's where we get the word carbine is, you know, carabineer, carbine. Um, basically had a shorter musket and they could fire it from horseback and reload. Paget's advance threatened the flank of Mermet's attack on Elvinia, and he too was forced to withdraw, while an attack on the right by Delaborde's infantry secured a foothold in the village of Piedra Longa, but got bogged down in heavy skirmishing. Around 6pm, dusk fell, and firing died out across the battlefield. News that the British line had held reached Moore shortly before he died in Coruña, around 8 p.m. That's sad. I mean, at least he knew that his line held before he died. That night, the British lit campfires and posted sentries, then silently withdrew to Coruña to begin embarkation. And the reason light fires is to make it look like you're still fucking there and you can get back to it with it. Mission accomplished. And more did... You know, basically more probably heard about this was going to happen because the line held and died rather peacefully, I would assume. The next morning, the French found the enemy positions abandoned. But they were slow to take advantage. It wasn't until noon that they were able to bring up six cannon and get them into position overlooking the Bay of Coruña. The British had almost completed their evacuation by the time the French guns opened fire. In a hurried departure, a few British transports ran aground, and two were set on fire. But overall, losses were light. Those were very, very light. The French had the opportunity to do a lot of massive damage there, but missed them. A small Spanish garrison held Coruña, waiting until the British fleet had escaped to sea before surrendering. And by the rules of war, that is legal. Um, and they are supposed to be given, you know, quarter and all that stuff. They did surrender. Right? So. I hope the people of England will be satisfied. I hope my country will do me justice. The last words of Sir John Moore. So yeah, he uh, died like a true Englishman. <laughs> I was told about, I mean, he did his job, right? He got the entire army home, which is fucking amazing. Whether Moore's retreat to Coruña was a British disaster or miraculous escape is still debated. Uh. My opinion, miraculous escape. <laughs> you don't get that many men out. You don't pull a Dunkirk like this, and, you know, and be like a massive defeat. Did he abandon Spain in its hour of need? Or draw off Napoleon's main force, buying time for others? Either way, Britain's only army had been saved, and would return to fight another day. Yeah, their only army, because Britain doesn't have a lot of armed forces. Their navy's big, but their army's not. While Napoleon now faced the prospect of a long war on the Iberian Peninsula, and renewed conflict with Austria, a war on two fronts that would challenge his empire like never before. And this is where it starts to go all wrong. Napoleon had blundered in Spain, but it was years before the scale of his mistake was evident. Then he would say, I embarked pretty badly on this affair, I admit it. The immorality showed too obviously. The injustice was too cynical. The whole of it remains very ugly. I mean, you gotta give him credit when he says that I fucked up. I mean, there's generals, <laughs> there's generals in our past that don't even do that, so, I mean, yeah. If you'd like to learn more about the Peninsula War, or any of the campaigns across Europe, our sponsor, Osprey Publishing, has nearly 200 titles on the Napoleonic Wars, written by specialist historians, and covering everything from the history of elite units to tactics, weapons, and uniforms. Visit their website to find out more. I think it is the end of the video, so I will leave you people there. Hopefully you liked that video. Um, otherwise, 
you leave a like for me, subscribe for more content. We'll be continuing this series. Uh, other than that, tell me what you thought. I'll see you people next time.